Hello and welcome to Spirit Pig. Inspired by the mission 7 Billion Fulfilled People, I track down the greatest thought leaders on the planet and interview them about happiness and fulfillment. Today I'm speaking with Dr. Isaiah Hankel. Isaiah received his doctorate in anatomy and cell biology and is an expert on mental focus, behavioral psychology and career development. He's the author of the books Black Hole Focus, which became a business bestseller internationally, and The Science of Intelligent Achievement. His work has been featured in The Guardian, Fast Company, Entrepreneur Magazine, and he's regularly invited to speak at some of the world's top institutions, such as Harvard Medical School, Stanford University, Oxford University, and the Marie Curie Institute in France. So, Isaiah, thank you so much for being here today. It's going to be a fun one. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, Duncan. I'm looking forward to it. One, one of the things I, uh, I liked about, I've, <clears throat> I said a second ago, I've been checking out a lot of your videos and TED Talks and um, you always have like a, a great sort of study to, uh, to, to uh, illustrate a lot of your points. And um, one of the ones I liked was uh, actually a study at the University of Leeds. Uh, you take any large group of people and you only need to get, I think, 5% to move in any particular direction for the rest of the group to follow without knowing why. What, what, when, you, when you hear that study, what, what does it make you think? Yeah, so I think what it makes me think about is that we are all biologically driven to follow other people. I think if you asked asked any individual person if they're doing what they want to do or what other people want them to do, what are they going to say? They're going to say, I'm doing what I want to do. Um, But scientifically, uh, we see a different picture, right? We see that we are, we follow those around us. Uh, if you get a, a herd of people together, right, whether at a concert, whatever else, we've all experienced this and s- somebody somewhere at the front's moving in a different direction. We'll just start following them. We, we've all experienced this when we are walking with a friend and then we realize both of us are following the other person and we're like, all right, where do you know where you're going? No. Do you know where you're going? No. Right. And we just automatically do this. It's our default to follow other people. And, and there's a, there's a lot of studies on this that it goes beyond just, you know, routine things like, you know, walking to a, 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 a place that both you and your friend don't know where it's at. It goes beyond that to huge goals that we set for ourselves, right? Um, things like happiness, success, so the, the biggest things we're trying to achieve. We, we actually look to other people for indicators on what we should achieve. There's a, another great study, since you brought it up, um, that, that shows that if we, are, if we read uh, somebody else's goals and then we're asked to go sit in a room and write down our own personal goals, the goals are twice as likely to reflect the person's goals who we read instead of our own. Versus a control group where we were just asked to sit down and write down those goals. Like the things around us, the reference points, other people, they're, they're affecting everything we do on a daily basis. Well, when you, when you said that first, um, the one before, it made me think of, um, I'm from England originally, and we, I think we were notorious, we love to queue. I, I can't remember exactly what it is, but you know, if you have two ATMs next to each other, you often see it in like a train station. And um, I think if there's two or three people waiting for one and none for the other, everyone just assumes obviously it's broken. So you might have like a, a queue of like 10, 15 people, and then no one's using the ATM on the right, which is, which works yes. absolutely fine. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's like with an elevator, right? Like if an elevator has a button that doesn't light up, you'll have a crowd of people standing around and everybody assumes that they press the button and it just doesn't work. <laughs> but then every, and then if you're the guy that goes and presses it or the girl that goes and presses it and it's not working, you know, you, you're, you look like an idiot and you're afraid to look like an idiot. But every now and then you press it and it turns on and everybody was just standing there. And so I think that's, it says a lot about uh, what we're talking about right now is that you, you know, putting yourself out there to look stupid is what keeps a lot of us doing what other people are doing because we don't want to be different. But all the good stuff is stepping up, you know, to the ATM without the queue, is, is pressing the button when everybody's looking at you. If you were purely from the point of view of uh, just numbers, look at the data, I think people who actually, if you're, if you're interested in money, just take that as your metric. People who set goals versus people who don't set goals, like the difference is, People who set goals earn nine times as much money as those who don't. That, that's, that's not even like a, a 10, 20 percent increase. Nine times. That's, so the difference is between 30,000 salary and 270. Was that right? Exactly. And, and these are scientific studies. And people think we think of goals as just something that's arbitrary, optional, not really going to make a difference. But, you know, wh- what gets measured gets managed. It's my fa- one of my favorite quotes from uh, I think it's Munger. And, and basically what it means is that if you're write, writing something down and you're checking it, you're going to make sure you're making progress towards whatever that is. You keep it in a part of your brain called your reticular activating system. Everything you read, all your references, you're going to pick up on things that are going to help you get to that goal that you wrote down. And it's, it's, it's a fact. If you write down something, no matter what it is, you're about 33% more likely to achieve it. And money-wise, like you said, 
nine times as much. That's that's the difference between thirty thousand dollars, which is you know essentially poverty for most countries, uh, versus two hundred seventy thousand dollars, which is quarter of a million. It's it's a big difference, and it's it it should motivate you to turn this into a, a lifelong habit. Just writing down what you want to achieve and reflecting on it. Okay, so okay, so in 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 the business context, or say we're trying to achieve a specific aim, like we're trying to run a marathon, then the idea of goals and focus, like the, the question of like, why do we need focus maybe seems obvious, mm. but let's, let's look at it in terms of life as an example. What's wrong with just seeing how things unfold? You mean just kind of hanging back and letting life happen to you, right? I think, um, you know, for some people that works some of the time and, you know, some people might work all the time. It all depends. But usually sooner or later, life will test you on that, right? Life will put you in a position that you do not want to be in sooner or later. And then you're going, you're going to have to uh, face that challenge. And and what tools are you going to have at your disposal at that point? What tools have you sharpened at that point? And I think a lot of people who just kind of breeze through life and, and don't prepare themselves for adversity when they're faced with adversity, they crumble. Um, and, and so the whole point of setting goals is so that you're challenging yourself and pushing yourself and harnessing your focus so that when you are faced with adversity, you don't crumble. You are prepared. You can say, okay, I need to overcome this adversity. I'm going to set a goal, measure my progress towards it, uh, you know, be flexible and, and get past this adversity instead of letting it crush me. How does this fit in with, um, I'm just playing, because to be fair, I, I'm reading everything I read of yours. No, I totally, I totally buy into it. I believe it, but I'm gonna, I want to play devil's advocate a little bit just because sure. it's, it's interesting. Um, okay, so how does this fit in with regards to control? So, for example, I think maybe humans are maybe naively like to think that we've got, we've got it. We've, we, you know, we can kind of control life, and but actually, there's so much that's out of our control. So, like the idea of like you know a five year plan or a ten year plan. Do you think that's actually just kidding ourselves? Who knows what's going to happen in six months' time or like a year's time? So, wh- where's that balance between yeah having a direction, knowing what like you want to aim for or aim towards, versus like just kidding ourselves that we've actually got control over? You know, who who, who knows? Yeah, I think. Well, I think what a lot of people do is they use the word or instead of and. Right. Really, the question you're asking is, you know, can you be committed? and flexible at the same time. It's not an either or, right? You can be both committed and flexible. It's not one or the other. And, and so what I suggest is, you know, you set some big goals for yourself, something off in the distance that you want to achieve. You might have a big five to 10 year goal. That's firm. That's 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 what you're looking at on a daily basis. You might have some shorter term goals or benchmarks, right? Maybe a, a one year goal, maybe a six month, a daily goal. And this is going to help guide you to, to becoming the person that you want to be. Um, but at the same time, if something happens in your life, and it will, right? We've all seen these little memes where it's like, this is the plan you thought you had. It's just a straight line. And like, this is the actual plan. And it's just, you know, like boulders and, you know, lakes and dams and rivers you have to cross. It, it, things get tough. And so you have to be flexible. So stay flexible in your processes, but stay firm in your principles. That's what I like to say. So stay firm in your principles, firm in those big goals you want to have, but be flexible too. For example, you know, in the book I say, you know, if your goal, lifelong goal is to go to India, um, but you you win a surprise trip to Indonesia on a radio show, don't say, "Well, no, I want. I'm only going to go to India." Like, go to Indonesia, right? And and be flexible. And then maybe when you're there, you'll you'll be able to get to India. So be flexible in your processes, but be firm in your principles. Set some of those goals that you have firmly in the distance, but be flexible in terms of the path to achieving those goals. In the 1950s, there's a guy called Kurt Richter, and he conducted some really interesting experiments to do with hope. What can you explain those to our audience? Yeah, hope experiments. So I, this is I read this. I love reading, reading scientific studies um, that have to do with how people are motivated, and I love seeing you know results that are very black and white, and, and where there's a great comparison. And in this case, there was. So th- this guy basically took two groups of rats, and he had. He had one group of rats. He put in this, these buckets of circulating water, uh, circulating water, and he had them swim for as long as they could. And and the longest that a rat could swim on average was about 15 minutes. He put a, another group of rats in the same buckets of circulating water, and they swam for about four, like 14 minutes and 59 seconds, right before they started to sink. Then he saved the rats, dried them off, let them rest for a little bit, put them back in the same buckets of circulating water. And then what I always say, if I'm if I'm speaking like on stage about this, I'm like, guess how many guess how long the rats could swim the second time, right? Most people are like, maybe seven minutes, maybe a minute. They actually were able to s- swim for 60 hours. 
So over 200 times longer than the first group of rats, which doesn't make any sense, right? Because they didn't inject them with steroids and they didn't let the rats rest long enough to grow more muscle. If anything, they should have been more tired. So what happened? And the conclusion was, is that the, the rats gained hope. Um, but I think the, the better conclusion is that the rats gained energy through hope, right? So they had a vision of what being saved looked like. Like they saw that uncertainty of what was happening when they were swimming in that water went away. They knew what was going to happen. If they swam long enough, somebody was going to grab them, save them, they were going to be fine. So they kept swimming for it. And I think that's what it's like for us. And, and we've all experienced that, right? Like you just get this little taste. We finally see that all of our hard work is paying off. And then it's just like, we light up, right? We see the light at the end of the tunnel and our energy levels go through the roof. Our focus goes through the roof. But it's those those dark moments where you haven't seen any progress and you've been trying for a long time. You're, you're drowning in the bucket like a rat. You have to keep swimming though because sooner or later you're going to get that morsel. You're going to see. You're going to see that little piece of growth and that's going to jack up your energy levels. And it's, it's biological. So you just have to keep moving forward. And, and what's great about goals is that it gives you that morsel. Like when you set goals for yourself, you can set out those those morsels for yourself so that you see that you hit that benchmark. You actually know you're moving forward and that's what's going to keep your energy levels high. Okay. Well, that, that, what you just said at the end, that touch, I was going to say like, it's okay, how can we apply that in our lives? Okay. So that it's about having those little benchmarks, those morsels. And that is, that's the hope that we need. That's the thing which is kind of pulling us towards something like a, a positive yeah. future, something that's we're, we're excited about, we're, we're, we're drawn towards. Right. Otherwise, you're just, you know, you're living like the the rat in the bucket, completely uncertain about what's happening, right? You're just swimming and swimming and swimming and swimming. Like, have I made any progress? Have I actually moved the needle at all? You don't know because you haven't put down any goals. You haven't measured your progress. You haven't looked at the feedback at all, you know, and, and most people just don't think to do it. Like, if I ask you right now, like, are you where you want to be? You might say, no, I'm not, or I don't know, or come up with some answer that's not interesting at all, right? But if I say, are you further along today? in this area, you know, whatever area, X, Y, Z area, than you were a year ago, you're probably going to say, oh yeah, I am further along, right? But you need to define that. So, you know, so you have that answer. I'm exactly here. Last year I was here and, and that's, what's going to keep you energized. And you have to reflect on this constantly so that you can keep your energy levels up because your focus, which is, is really your mental energy is your most valuable resource. Mm. I know that you, posted a video recently on YouTube where you kind of explain that your previous thoughts and teachings about happiness and some of your thoughts about them were actually wrong. T tell me about that. Why, what, what was that video about and what was the update? Yeah. So I think it, you know, one, one of the prime human needs that we all have is growth, right? And, uh, in my first book, Black Hole Focus, I said that happiness is experiencing growth in every area of your life. And, and I, I think that was wrong. And so I talk about this more in my new book, The Science of Intelligent Achievement. But happiness is experiencing growth in any area of your life, not every area. And so what the mistake that a lot of us make is that, is that we say that I can only be happy if I'm growing in every single area of my life. Or we we really, we make our life one dimensional and we're just focused on business or we're just focused on family or we're just focused on whatever hobby. And if we have a bad day in that one area, we don't experience growth in that one area, there goes our happiness, right? So really what you need to do is you need to not tie your identity to just one thing. You need to have multiple things happening in your life, right? Maybe it's your, your go to the gym and take care of your health. Maybe you have friends and family. Maybe you're working on a business, a side project, whatever it is. Have multiple areas where you can experience growth daily. So no matter what happens, you're experiencing growth in at least one area of your life. And that's happiness. It doesn't have to be every area. It's any area. What do you mean by creative ownership? What does that phrase mean? Creative ownership. I, I think this is something that's not talked about enough. Um, what makes people miserable in life is being dependent on other people for your happiness and success. I don't care who you are, but if you become too dependent on somebody, you're going to be miserable. And you'll probably be a miserable person, right? Some of us are dependent on a boss, right? We're dependent on one single person. Maybe it's a middle manager, whoever it is, one person that controls our career fate, whether or not we get a promotion, whether or not we go to the office and have a good day, that one person decides our success and happiness. That's dependency. That's not good. Um, so, uh, sometimes people get in relationships and it's, and they look to that one person for all of their happiness, right? Whether they had a successful day is if they made that person happy and they tie everything to that one person and, and they become completely dependent on that one person. If that person's mood is down, their mood is down, right? And, and this goes on and on in life, your personal life, professional life, everything. And so what creative ownership is about is creating 
areas of your life, things that you own, right? A personal project, something like starting a book, uh, starting a a podcast, right? Starting um, a, a new business, something that you own completely. So no matter what you're doing, you can experience a sense of growth. Here. Like you're completely in control, which you brought up earlier, over your growth in this area. Nobody else is. You're not dependent on anybody else. It's very freeing. It opens up a lot of possibilities. It gives you more of a abundant mentality. It, it opens you up to be more creative. Um, and ultimately, what it can lead to is you having outlets for other things like more financial success, right? Maybe you turn a podcast into something that that uh, makes you money. Maybe you sell a book that you just were writing for fun as a personal project. So creative ownership is crucial. And in today's world, it's easier than ever, right? To, to do something like start a business, you used to need a, a factory, right, with 100 workers. Now you need an internet connection. And, and you can connect with anybody anywhere in the world, just like we are now. I guess, and also, I guess if you, if you then, if you've got that creative ownership, if you've got that something which is like, it's your little baby, whatever it is, then when you turn up to your relationship or your job, like let's use the relationship example, if you're no longer of the mindset of like, I need this person, you're, you're coming at a much more, like you're already like filled up. And so then you can just come, just be, you know, just be a great partner, but you don't, you don't need them to, you know, to fill you up with the, the happiness quotient, the joy, the, the love, the sex, the whatever. You can just literally just turn up already, come for already, already full. And so I guess that's, that's a much more, uh, empowering position to come to be and much more like much better for the other person as well, rather than being this needy, like I need you to yes. fix me. And we've all seen that, right? Like it's one of the most common things in the world is seeing some, for example, you, you see people's parents get a divorce, right? And after they get divorced, before before the divorce, they're 30, 40 pounds overweight. They're not happy. They're miserable. They're not doing any hobbies. They just come home. They sit in front of the TV. Then they get divorced. They start taking on all these new hobbies. They start rock climbing or skiing or going out, meeting new people. They lose weight. They get back in shape. What happened? Like, There's no reason they couldn't have done that before and the relationship would have been a lot better, but they became kind of codependent and they relied on each other for their happiness. Like they, one person couldn't do what they really wanted to do because they wanted to keep the other person happy and the other person couldn't do what they really wanted to do because they were worried about upsetting the other person. So they weren't who they needed to be. They weren't independent and being independent makes you um, the best possible person in relationships. It makes you the best possible worker in businesses and, and companies know this too. That's why a lot of companies allow you to have a certain percentage of your time where you can work on whatever you want to work on. And, and they're making you less beholden to doing the, the same old routine nine to five work because of this. Independence is freeing. It makes people creative. It makes them work harder. Um, it, it makes them better people overall. A lot of people are concerned uh, about the threat of automation, loss of jobs, loss of opportunities. What are, what are some skills that people must learn in order to secure their future? Yeah, so I, I think oral communication is crucial. I mean, even if, if you look at a lot of the technology that's coming out, not you know, Siri is the tip of the iceberg, Amazon Echo, whatever, doesn't matter. What you know, our ability to orally communicate, and not just to be able to say words, but how rapidly we can change our pitch and the pace of our voice, sarcasm, comedy, stuff that computers are decades away from figuring out. You know, I'm sorry, everybody that says that we're close to like the singularity is wrong. Um, in terms of like the next five to 10 years. So you can be, you can be assured in the next 10 years, oral communication is going to be crucial. So being able to speak to people and not just look at a computer screen is going, is, 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 is very important. Um, so that's the first one. And, and then I also think that, um, beyond that, the ability to initiate, to take action, right? Like to make something happen. That's the biggest limiting factor, really. Like, like if, you, if people have ideas all day long, right? We all know somebody who just talks about ideas constantly and they never execute, execution is so powerful like actually you know especially in today's world especially i would say with you know millennials um even a little bit of gener generation x um we, we have our heads in the cloud right everything's possible like technology is amazing you can do anything you can go live in thailand and start a podcast and do all this stuff but will you actually start something will you actually ha learn you know in 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 the trenches, what it takes to make something happen. Taking that action, initiating is tough, man. And not everybody has that, has that skill. So learning to initiate. And then finally, the ability to make decisions, smart decisions. You know, a computer program can only go down certain programmed paths. It can only make decisions based on what it was programmed to do, what was coded. Um, your human brain is insanely powerful because you can make decisions a computer cannot make decisions in the same way unless it was programmed to you can make completely new creative decisions um, that couldn't possibly have been 
created um, before. And so I think your ability to mentally decide something and to make smart decisions, your executive function is crucial. And a lot of people don't, they don't use that. They, they just, they, you know, if, you, if somebody asks you, where do you want to go eat? Most of us is like, I don't know, wherever you want to go. And then just make a decision, like get used to it, get used to making snap decisions. Like you can always t- correct course later. Um, but practicing your executive fun- function is crucial. And it's one of those skills that humans uniquely have. Is I heard a um, analogy the other day, which um, about well, maybe, maybe almost about yeah decision making because we often um, kind of have this idea it's got to be the perfect decision and we kind of like always second guessing everything as opposed to just making a decision. They use the analogy of uh, an airplane. Say an airplane is flying from London to New York. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna butcher the actual statistic. I can't remember exactly, but it's something like it is it is it is going in the wrong direction. Something like 99.9 percent of the time, and it's basically like it's it goes the wrong direction, and then it's like autocorrect. It's wrong direction, autocorrect. Wrong direction, autocorrect. So the autopilot is literally just constantly just putting it back in course. But like 99 percent of the time, it's effectively going in the wrong direction. And I think when you think about that in terms of decision making. Just, just make the decision, and then look at the evidence. Look what you know. Look what the data yes. says. Okay, then autocorrect. You know, and um, as opposed yes. to this one decision, it's got to be perfect. It takes me six months to make, and it's got to. You know, I'm stressing. Just make the decision. Mm. I love that. Yeah, and and the most succinct way that I've heard that said that I've loved, and it really just changed my perspective was, you know, most people want to aim, 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 fire, but really you should be fire, fire, fire aim right because the, the firing is what's going to give you the data to know where you need to aim yeah talking about that data point um you were i can't remember the name i can't remember the name but it was it was, a, it was a youtube video i think it was actually even two days ago it was about the importance of uh what was it it was the importance of rather than like following always your, always your feelings following trends trends that was it yeah, I think, you know, f- following data instead of just the way you feel on a day-to-day basis. And and it can be following data in terms of where the data is trending, for example. Like a lot of people, they they take one data point. Like they're having such a bad day-to-day in their relationship. They're having such a bad day at work. And they're like, this is ridiculous. Like this job is the reason I'm miserable. This person's the reason I'm miserable. So everything needs to change right now. But if they actually zoomed out and looked at more data points and they said, oh, I'm actually happy at work nine days out of ten or 20 days out of 30, right? In that case, it changes the whole statistic, right? Um, It would be like, oh, I'm usually happy at work. I'm just miserable every now and then. And you can actually dig in a little bit deeper and say, you know, oh, every, every day at this time or every day on this week or, you know, every day this month, it's just going to be a hard day at work and you can start expecting it. And and instead of having it ruin your day and ruin your life because you feel bad that day when you expect it, it's not going to be that hard, right? So in science, we say you got to increase your N value, right? When you're just looking at one data point, you have an N of one. You want to collect more data points. And this this is true for success too. Um, You have to look back, what I said previously, you know, if you feel right now that you're not where you want to be, zoom out. And look at the trend from a year ago. Are you further along than you were last year in this area? How much further along? What do you want the trend to be? How, are you further along than you were five years ago? So, so looking at trends is is crucial, uh, not just for happiness, but all, but also for success in every area of your life. When you said that, it made me think. Oh, I just literally just typed it down. Um, I guess also it's the difference of. Um, Say, so, so like the old example, you have, you have a crap day. And so if, if you're just looking at it just at that one data point, then it can completely throw you off. It throws you completely off balance. But I guess it's sort of the difference between short-term thinking and long-term thinking. So if we are looking at everything, so let's use investment. You Say you're a day trader. Every up and down in the market, the stock market goes up, exactly. it goes down, it goes up. It is... If, if, if you've got like, you know, the stomach for it, then, then great. But it's potentially just so volatile and so exhausting and so like up, down, up, down, up, down. And it's, you know, but if you zoom out and take like a, a 100 year view, so you're mm. looking a long term view, then suddenly these tiny little dips, I mean, you can't even see them. And it's just like it's just got, you know, either like an upward trend or a downward trend. But it's it takes away a lot of that volatility. And so by the sounds mm. of it rather than looking at one data point versus many data points, it's that difference between like just short-term thinking. Am I literally just looking at this volatility or am I looking at the big picture? Exactly. And I mean, learn not to be an alarmist, right? Everybody today is an alarmist. Like, God, this is so important. This is so urgent. And, and we allow people that are alarmists into our life. And this is a mistake, you know, to bring things full circle back to what we talked about in the beginning. Um, the people that you surround yourself with affect you. So if you're surrounded by people that are, 
short-term thinkers that are alarmed at everything that's happening, thinks everything's urgent. They're freaking out every time the stock market goes down or freaking out every time they have a bad day, creating drama. You don't need those people in your life because you're going to start to mimic them. You're going to follow them just like the sheep in the study from Leeds we talked about in the beginning. So instead, you want to zoom out, not be an alarmist, surround yourself with people who are also not alarmists, who can see the trends, who aren't just you know, uh, rising and falling with how they feel that day. Um, and, and you'll learn to be that way too. And there's, there's actually, um, and I mean, that sounds like, you know, a great idea, but there's actually, there's actually scientific and there's actually data saying exactly what you said. So what numer- numerically, each positive person you surround yourself with increases your chances of being positive by just, it's you know, 11%, not bad, but 11%. However, each negative person you let into your life more than doubles your chances of being negative. That that's quite, that's quite a big difference, isn't it? It is. Yeah. And so they, I mean, people study the way that emotions travel through networks the same way that like the flu virus travels through networks and they can see it's epidemiologists, epidemiologists, right? They can see that emotions are fluctuating through groups of people and traveling the same way that again, influenza would be. And when it's a positive emotion, it doesn't travel very far, right? It, it has a little bit of an impact, but it's a much smaller impact. It still matters, but it's smaller. Our brain has a negativity bias and it's because, because this little part of our brain called the amygdala, right? This very old ancient part of our brain that just is like a six lane highway for negative information right into our long-term memory banks. And so when you see negative information, you're around a negative person, you're going to become negative because your brain just loves it. It's super sticky to your brain. So you have to get rid of the negative people out of your life um or else you're just you're you're living with a handicap Ten thousand hour rule it's um yeah popular rule that's kind of being popularized um you know if anyone who doesn't know you know the idea that it takes about ten thousand hours of deliberate practice needed to become world class in any field you talk about how you can actually get ten thousand hours worth of experience in less than a year what what what's that how yeah it's it's, it's leaning on the science of how people are productive and how they learn. And and there's a variety of things you can do. Convergence is one of them, right? So if you want to reach 10,000 hours in a couple of different skills, you need to converge your efforts. Um, you need to uh, do things that are similar at the same time, right? So if, like for me, I wanted to gain more experience in science and in writing and in communication. So I would start writing about science and then presenting on it, right? So all three of those things. Habits, ritualization, your brain has this an amazing ability to turn anything into a habit, right? Which can make anything scale. Thanks to a part of your brain called your basal ganglia, where you can basically offload difficult tasks, tasks that would require you to think and process. You can offload these to the basal ganglia so they happen automatically through the process of habit, right? You do something enough, it's automatic. It's it's like driving home from work. After doing it enough times, you don't even think about driving home, right? You, you get there and then you, you're like, did I just – completely blank out the last 10 minutes driving home. Like, so there's there's a variety of things you can do. The book goes into a, a lot of details. I, I think those are two of the best ones. You know, you can, you got to control your environment also. If you're trying to lose weight, don't keep a pint of ice cream in the freezer because every time you walk by it, you have to make a decision not to eat it. And you only have a set, set amount of decision-making units um, every day that you wake up, right? It's something called willpower depletion. And once your willpower is depleted, you're going to grab that ice cream. So, but if it's not there, you don't have to make that decision. And even if you or your willpower is depleted, the ice cream is not there for you to eat. And so by, I guess by knowing these little uh, ways, these little intricacies, the way our brain works, um, then it kind of gives you power and it gives you kind of like a sense of freedom. So rather than it being, um, you're subjected just to like, oh, this is my biology, there's nothing I can do. You can set your life up and you can design your life to make it to make it easier for yourself exactly yeah exactly and that's that's what it's about is is leveraging science leveraging your biology to work to your advantage to help you achieve happiness success as you call it fulfillment instead of to to lead to your your downfall or to to lead to squandering everything that you can become in life what does a fulfilled life mean to you a fulfilled life for me it really comes comes down to growth, right? And I, I think seeing that growth in your area and, and growing in a way that positively impacts other people, that's fulfillment. What is one thing our listeners can start doing today that will have a positive impact on their lives? I would say, you know, number one, look at the people that you've passively al- allowed into your life. You probably have some friends, and my new book talks a lot about this. You probably have some friends in your life who aren't real friends, right? They're, it's not a reciprocal friendship. Either they add a lot of value back to you and you don't add any value to them 
or you add a lot of value to them and they don't add any back to you. Um, these friendships can be very draining. You know, the negative people in your life, like we talked about, can be very draining. Look, t- do a careful analysis of, of your friendships, the relationships that are in your life. Do an audit, if you will, gain some emotional distance and, and be deliberate with who you let into your life because more than anything else, the people that you're around are going to affect your decisions. They're going to affect your goals. They're going to affect your progress, your happiness, success, and fulfillment. Last but not least, how can people find out more about you and your work? Where can we send them? Yeah, the easiest thing is just to go to isaiahenkel.com. My first and last name together, I-S-A-I-A-H-W-H in the middle there, and then H-A-N-K-E-L. Isaiah, it was, this was fascinating. Thank you so much for, for speaking with us, for sharing these amazing studies, for giving us some serious food for thought. Um, really appreciate it. And I hope you've, this is this, I think this is my first ever interview where we're actually on different days. So you, 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 it's Thursday with you and it's Friday with me. Normally whenever I interview, it's on the same day, but you're on the, um, the West Coast of uh, America and I'm in Sri Lanka. So I don't know what the time difference is, like 13 wow. and a half hours or something. Yeah, quite a bit. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And for you for staying up late. It's, um, yeah, it's been great fun.